Hey kids, uh, sorry about that. I needed to get ready for Cat Halloween. See, um, Hercules and Bo have already gone off and done that uh, Cat Halloween thing. So I guess, oh, thanks Billy. I'll have to go get that ready for them. Oh. Thank you. Uh, looks like it's a telegram. I know they still sent these. Uh, seems to be from a Nigerian prince. Ah, royalty. It says here that he's trapped in the deep web. Oh no, that's terrible. Let's see here. Uh, oh, there, there's a spell attached. Uh, it says if I read the spell, it will free him, and then he'll be able to share his vast fortune of $11 billion with me. Holy cow! Okay, $11 billion. Ooh, I should buy a lot of pumpkin spice kitty litter. Okay. <clears throat> Here's a spell. Let dark be light and left be right. Let black be white, and day be night. Let death be life, let blind be sight, let all these things trade place. Tonight! What's going on? Wait, wait. Is this the Nigerian prince's place? <laughs> There's no Nigerian prince, you idiot! That's right, kitties. It's me, Bizarre MCP, and I'm back once again and banish that fool back to the Shadow Realm. And this year is going to be different than ever before. I know of a spell that's within this little book that'll be able to lock him away forever, letting me take his place here in the real world. Uh, I'd better get rid of this to make sure that nobody recognizes me. There we go. Now. Or what's I? Right, that spell. Rulier Cthulhu Fatagan. Wait, no, that's not it. <clears throat> she got a big booty, so I call her Big Booty. Wait, guys. Uh, actually, this this may take a while. That's fine, he's got those videos queued up for you. You kids enjoy a video, and as soon as it's over with, BAM! I'm not a killer. I know I'm not. And in this diary, you should see as much evidence as I can collect to show that I'm not. Except what you'll probably see are the rantings of a madman. I assure you, I'm not crazy. But by God, these experiences will eventually push me into madness. The tube head thing called me out again last night, and I managed to make some notes and uh, a few sketches. I haven't been able to write for a few hours as I've been physically shaking and felt as though I was weakened by some kind of poison, maybe even some form of radiation, as I've detailed. My memories of last night are vivid, but as I look through my notes and sketches, I question whether it really could have happened. According to my notes, the pull came around seven yesterday evening, the same way as always, with a tightening in my abdomen. It's like there's an alien hand inside my belly, squeezing my guts putting painful pressure on me when I'm moving in the wrong direction and giving relief when I'm heading the right way. I got into the car, and I followed the pull which set me off driving west. This time I managed to call into a few service stations that I passed along the route and bought a few simple items just to keep the receipts. I bought a chocolate bar in one and a drink in the next. I'll attach the receipts to this diary entry as those receipts form a log of the journey with times and locations on them. All I really recall of the journey is heading down the motorway for a long time in terrible weather. It was dark and wet, and the road surface felt so bad that every driver out there was well below the speed limit. When I strain my memory, and try to recall, all I get is the hypnotic sound of the windscreen wipers. There's no detail to the route I took, and then I remember driving along country roads and between farms. 
I remember a car coming toward me with its high beam headlights glaring at me and feeling as though I was at great risk of crashing. The shock woke me from the dreamy state and in the moment of blindness I felt that alien hand in my stomach tightening and relaxing as I turned the steering wheel to avoid the crash. Whatever this thing is that sends me on these journeys also make sure I get there in one piece. Maybe that's why the journey feels so dreamy. Its guidance is so firm that I suspect I could drive blindfolded and this thing would give me the sensation on which, which way to turn the wheel. I went to Wales. That's what the service station receipts say. I started in Oxford and drove west. The last receipt that I have is from a place called Swifred, which I've learned this morning is a few miles west of Pontypool. I've been researching the local area on the internet to try and trace the route, and the type of countryside and woodland that I'm seeing online fits my memories. I brought the car to a halt by some woodland and began walking through the forest. I had my waterproof coat, which is generally very practical, but it was raining so heavily that eventually the water began to seep into everything. My jeans felt wet all the way through and even the socks and my boots began to feel moist. I must have been outside for some time to get into that condition. I remember at one point I had a walking from that dreamy state to listen to the rain fall on my hood. The sound of rain hitting the fabric is quite loud, and for a moment it woke me up. I remember looking down at my boots in the darkness in the middle of this forest and sensing that they were caked in mud. I couldn't see them, of course. It was far too dark, but that sticky, claggy, muddy feeling was profound. They were hiking boots, but it felt as though all the tread had been filled with earth and they now slipped in the mud. I don't know how long I waited in the forest, but eventually I was coaxed onward and brought to a small cottage. It was quaint. A single story building painted white with a door in the center and a small window on either side. I suspected it was a small holding or micro farm. It was too dark to see properly, but there appeared to be a field of vegetables and a chicken coop. I made it to the first window and I looked into that rustic kitchen. The lights were off, but enough illumination spilled in through the door that I could see a solid oak farmhouse table with two chairs. There were patterned plates and racks, mugs on a mug tree. The surfaces were clean and tidy, but everything looked old. The rain was incessant, and as I moved to the other window, I could remember skidding through the mud and almost falling. At the second window, I saw an old woman sitting in a wing-back chair watching a small television. She had silvery hair and a weathered face, probably from working her farm to an age beyond which most people retired. As I laid my eyes on her, I felt the alien hand in my stomach tease me back towards the edge of the woodland. I knew that the old woman would be murdered. But there was a sensation I can only describe as emotional muting or dulling. She was going to be killed, and I knew in advance. But the force that had brought me out here to witness the murder was trying to keep my emotions in check. Ordinarily, I, I would be in a panic, as would any sensible human being. But the force that was in control was keeping my emotions subdued. This thing wanted me here as its witness, and it would make sure I was in an emotional state capable of recording the memory. Again, I must have turned out and fallen into the dreamy, hypnotized state as I was suddenly jarred from staring into space by the sound of rain on my hood and noticing that the cottage was cast in a yellowish to orange light. A sort of sodium glow cast by old streetlights. Now I could see that my hunch was right. It was a micro farm. There was a short field of root crops growing in furrows 
There was a chicken coop fenced off with wire to keep the foxes out. I could see the shadows moving as the light above swung around and positioned itself directly above. I knew not to look up. I wasn't supposed to witness the source of the light. Then the cottage front door opened. The old woman came out holding her hand to her eyes, looking up to the orange light above her home. She was dressed as though ready for bed in a white nightgown with a dark robe over her shoulders. She'd put on Wellington boots and come outside and she she moved quickly and spry. And I imagine her aged appearance came from working outdoors for many years, but her wrinkled face gave way to an obvious physical fitness. Probably from the exercise of farming and a healthy diet of homegrown foods. She came right out into the rain, with her hand up to stare at that orange light above her. Poor woman. She lived alone deep in the countryside. She was isolated. If she screamed, there would be nobody to hear but me. In my recollections, I imagined that I wanted to shout out for her to run, or that I wanted to help her, but these ideas, I know, are false memories. They're afterthoughts. At the time, my role was to witness, and I felt that all I could do. I had been brought to this spot to watch an old woman be murdered. And as I watched her standing out in the rain to view this orange light, I knew it would happen within minutes. I wish I could report that I was in some way frightened. I wish I could say that I was terrified, but at this point I wasn't. The thing that controlled me, the thing that had, had brought me here, that had brought me out to witness, was also keeping me in a calm and level-headed state. The orange light moved away, pulled back from the house. That was when I saw it. The tube head was here. The old lady hadn't noticed, but standing merely twelve feet away from her was the monster. Mostly human in form, it looked like a man in a black rubber suit. Only two things stopped it from looking human. Firstly, its fingers were long and thin and tapered to sharp points. There seemed to be no knuckles which made its fingers look like knife blades. They had the same shiny, rubber, latex appearance as the rest of it. Then its head was more like an extended neck that curved forward. The front of its face, if I could call it a face, was completely flat and featureless, a blank circle on the end of an eight-inch wide tube. It really looked like the neck of the thing had extended to several feet in length, then curved forward at 90 degrees. What should have been a head and face looked more like a, a fat drain pipe. It was soaking wet with rivulets of water running across the rubber surface, and it suddenly gave me a bitter aniseed taste in my mouth. I sensed that although its skin looked like rubber, it would really be like the shiny skin of a black slug. The taste in my mouth reminded me of licorice, and I wondered if that was what it would have tasted like if I ever had to put my tongue against it. It didn't move. The old woman remained outside watching the orange light until it vanished. But not a moment longer. I guess she would have remained in anticipation of it returning, had the rain not been so torrential. She turned to go back inside and actually turned towards the tube head, but somehow didn't see it. It was so close to her it was almost impossible to miss, but in the rain, in the darkness, its form was distinguished against the black patterns of the woodland. The old woman went back into our cottage and closed the door. And now the tube had moved. I took a step forward, its foot raising and reaching out with an odd flexibility, its legs bent in unnatural places as though the knee was higher in the leg than a human's, and the hip was set further back on the pelvis. Its feet had an extended heel that reached out behind it, and it walked with its arms slightly raised and its palms facing forward. It never looked at me, but I watched it clearer than ever as the water ran down its back 
and its knife-like fingers flexed around the door handle to make its way into the cottage. I was now alone, and the wait was interminable. I was unable to gauge how much time elapsed, but the longer I looked at the cottage, the more uneasy I became. The tube head had left the cottage door open after going inside, and I found myself staring at the home with a sense that something horrifying was happening within. All I could hear was the patter of rain against my hood, and then came a sudden flash of light from the living room window, and a sound like crunching glass. I thought it could be the television breaking, maybe something else. It was somehow familiar sounding, and it reminded me of the old photography flashbulbs that made a chemically inducing flash of light with a distinct popping noise. But it wasn't the sort of sound you'd expect to hear. Then from the door, Tube Head stepped slowly out and turned its flat face towards me. It had never done this before. Although I'm sure this thing draws me out to be its witness. It had never directly acknowledged my presence until this moment when it turned its head towards me. In the other killings, it had been quickly vanished. But this time, the loathsome thing watched me for a moment, then began slinking towards with its knife-like fingers spread wide and its flat face locked on mine. For the first time, I felt something closer to fear. It was still muted, not the pure terror I always feel after the event. What I felt was a severe bout of anxiety. I was worried that it was going to speak with me in some alien language, and I was filled with an overwhelming dread that I wouldn't be able to understand or respond. Tube had moved closer and closer, and I began to see that its skin was as smooth as glass. The rain was running over it in little streams and bouncing off the top of its head and shoulders and as it got as it got to within ten feet of me, the orange light appeared overhead, fading in like some alien spacecraft was arriving. As it got to within six feet, its flat round face seemed to emit some kind of energy like the likes of which I can barely describe. It was neither heat nor sound. I felt it as a warm vibration. It was as though it was spraying me with a mild sensation of pins and needles coming directly from its face and onto mine, and for a moment I suspected that I was being irradiated by some form of radiological source. There was definitely something there, whether it was x-rays, radar, microwave, or some other power it was emitting from tube head right into me. By the time it was three feet away from me, I could, I could feel my muscles losing their strength, I could and I'm convinced the energy it was projecting was the cause of this weakness. Never before had the tube head approached me, but this time it came to within eight inches and scrutinized me with a flat, eyeless face for at least a minute before walking into the forest and fading away, along with the orange light. And I now find myself alone. Of course, I was still under its influence. And I could feel the alien hand in my abdomen begin teasing me back into the forest so to guide me back to my car. I probably walked a half mile through pitch black forest and there was no way I'd find my car again without help. But before I left, I had to look in on the old woman. I expected the scene to be as bizarre and gruesome as the other four murders, and like the others, I was as astonished as I was repulsed. The remains of the old lady were laid on the floor and her garments open. Her full torso from neck to groin was sliced open, and the skin and bones of her ribcage peeled back to the floor to reveal the hollowness of her insides. Everything was gone. The organs, her lungs, heart, stomach, intestines, everything that was needed to keep a human being alive were missing. Her eyes were closed and 
Her wrinkled face looked serene. Her arms were outstretched, then below her arms were the neatly placed skin and ribs. Her spine still had some flesh to it, as it ran from her head to her pelvis, but the otherworldly method Tube had used to harvest from the old woman was ruthlessly effective. What he'd left behind looked like the clean carcass of a butchered animal. There was no blood to her corpse or to her surroundings. Tube head had taken her fluids and organs and just left the head, arms, legs, and skeleton, all neatly splayed like an anatomical drawing. The last thing I recall from the cottage is glancing back one last time to view my muddy footprints on the carpet. I can't imagine what Tube Head did with her organs. It wasn't carrying anything when it left the cottage. So what it did with her fluids and body parts is a mystery. There's no discernible reason why Tube Head should want to kill these people. There's nothing I could fathom that links the four previous murders with this one. There isn't any kind of similarity between the victims. This black rubbery thing just steals pieces of human beings. It, it turns its victims inside out and summons me to be its witness. I don't know how much longer I can keep my sanity whilst it continues. This isn't a dream. This isn't a hallucination. Nor am I a killer fabricating new memories to explain these crimes to myself. As with the other deaths, I've searched for evidence. Evidence that I'm not insane and creating crazy memories. I spent an hour searching my clothes and car, but I can't find a single drop of blood. There's, there's mud on my clothes, but no blood. The same as before. This convinces me that I've never touched the bodies or interfered with the murder scenes. I know, I know that the police will, will link these deaths by their sheer barbarity and viciousness. And they'll find forensic evidence such as my muddy footprints in the cottage. They'll... They're already talking about the previous murders on television and in the news, and I, I sense the police are being coy about the details. They don't want to alarm the, the, the public that there's a serial killer on the loose. Little would they believe me if I told them that it's a, a rubber-like man with a tube-like head, a, a flat face, fingers like knives. How can I explain that it draws me out to witness what it does? My god, I'm going to go mad if I can't get this under control. But as I write this journal entry, please believe me that I'm not responsible for these murders. It's this thing. This otherworldly thing that defies all logic and explanation. It pulled me out to witness its crimes. by some ungodly force and then brings me home and makes me believe it's all a dream but it isn't a dream I know I have service station receipts I have my notes my sketches and I'm writing this in advance of the old woman's murder being mentioned in the press my god please believe me when I say I'm not a killer. This year's 13-day Halloween countdown is in support of Dark Places, Evil Faces, a new collection brought to you by PS Publishing, and features New York Times bestsellers, some of horror's most prolific authors, and Vincent Venacop. Sales of the book Dark Places, Evil Faces goes to the Macmillan Cancer Support. It's a charity based out of the UK that gives aid to people and families suffering from cancer. So, this Halloween, I hope you all enjoy the stories, and I hope we can do some good in the world. Sweet dreams. Hey there, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta. Just wanted to say thanks so much for listening. You guys are what makes this channel worthwhile. There'll be new horror stories every Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday night, as well as gaming live streams every Friday and Sunday night. 
Please help support on patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta, and you can hear me as well as many other creepypasta narrators live 24-7 at scrmradio.com. Sweet dreams. <laughs>